A very big thank you um, to um, Wycliffe and to Pastor Paul um, for the opportunity to come and to be with you um, this past weekend. It's been absolutely fantastic for both Heidi and myself, and I've just been able to reconnect. Sometimes when we come to Pretoria, or when I come to Pretoria, it's a quick in and out. It's um, there's stuff that gets to get done, and we're running around, and, and it's, it's hard to connect. And so it's really just given us that opportunity this weekend to be able to just sit with folk and, and to really enjoy um, this community because you are a beautiful community and uh, God is using you and God will continue to use you um, in the years to come. And, and it's been a privilege really just to bring God's word to you and to be able to interact with the congregation over the weekend. And so this last message is going to be um, on um, Exodus chapter 12. Um, you know that we've been in Exodus and skipping back to um, the New Testament as well and just finding just what it is that God is wanting to, to say to us. And so Exodus 12 is um, the Passover chapter. And uh, I want to just share this because I knew there was going to be communion and there are some parallels that I believe that we can draw out from this particular passage. Uh, we know what has, has happened. We know that um, Moses has, has obeyed God and uh, told Pharaoh the different things, the different uh, plagues have happened. And this is right near the end of all of that. There's the final plague, which is spoken of, or the final uh, the plague on the firstborn, where the firstborn in families are going to die. And then this message of the Passover is given. And we know that the Passover is, is still celebrated in Jewish families. And uh, with Jesus, the Passover takes on a whole new meaning um, for us as believers and as followers of Christ. And so I'm not going to read the whole chapter, but I really do want to encourage you to read the whole chapter, uh, especially at this time, because if any of you know that I think it was Lent that started on Wednesday, it was Ash Wednesday, and now it's 40 days until Easter, so Easter's coming, and it's a good time to be thinking about the cross, and it's a good time to th be thinking about what it is that Jesus Christ came to do, and and what it is he has done in our lives, and what it is that he continues to do um, in our lives. And so, uh, chapter 12 of Exodus says this, The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in Egypt, This month is to be for you the first month, the first month of your year. Tell the whole community of Israel that the tenth day of this month, each man is to take a lamb for his family, one for each house household. If any household is too small for a whole lamb, they must share one with the nearest neighbor, having taken into account the number of people there are. And just a little bit of a side note, that was, they kind of, it was between 10 and 20 people that would gather. And so if the family was smaller than 10 people, then they would invite other families in, and they were instructed to bring that in. And still today, that's uh, to a large degree what, what happens. And um, so if there's any household is too small for the whole lamb, they must share one with the nearest neighbor, having taken into account the number of people there are. They are to determine the amount of lamb needed in accordance with what each person will eat. Uh, you'll understand that in a moment because basically they, from um, sunset really, from uh, dusk until the morning, they've got to eat um, everything. And whatever is not eaten has to be burned. And there's even a, a principle in that that we can pick up on a little bit later. And it says, um, you'll determine the amount of lamb needed in accordance with what each person will eat. The animals you choose must be a year old males without defect, and you may take them from the sheep or the goats. Take care of them until the 14th day of the month, when all the people of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight. Then they are to take some of the blood and put it on the sides and the tops of the door frames of the houses where they eat the lambs. That night, that same night, they are to eat the meat roasted over the fire along with bitter herbs and bread made without yeast. Do not eat the meat raw or cooked with water, but roast it over the fire, head, legs, and inner parts. Do not leave any of it until morning. If some of it is left in the morning, you must burn it. This is how you will eat it, with your cloak tucked into your belt, um, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. Eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. On that same night, I will pass through Egypt, and I will strike down the fir every firstborn, both men um, and animals. 
and I will bring judgment on the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood will be a sign on your houses where you are. And when you see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. Uh, there's a passage of Scripture just um, in remembering that I remember Pastor Mike gave me when um, we were commissioned. So some of you asked me when I started at, at Waterkloof. Well, I started in, in 1991. Uh, Heidi and I got married at the end of 1991, and she joined in, 2000, uh, in 1992. And, um, and then at the end of our studies, um, we, um, we were commissioned. We were asked to then become the youth pastor up until that stage. Um, I was the student pastor here, and then we became the youth pastor for the last six years of our time here. And um, Pastor Mike Ratt at the time uh, read this passage that has really stuck with me in it's such an incredible way. It says, remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the offspring of David, as preached in my gospel, for which I am suffering, bound with chains as criminals, but, with, but the word of God um, is not bound. And just this word, remember. And I don't know how you remember big events um, in your life. I think every one of us who are married will remember um, seeing our bride coming down the aisle. I can remember seeing Heidi coming down the aisle at the end of um, 1991. Uh, she was gorgeous. She's still gorgeous. And, um, and, and just being overwhelmed in that moment to just realize that this is, this is the lady that's going to be my bride. And uh, there are all kinds of things that we remember. We remember the birth of our children. Uh, we remember big events of things that have happened along the way, things that are, have been sad. One of the, the, the memories that I have of, of Watercliffe Baptist Church, I don't know how many of you were here in the church before the extensions of the church, but I think that the baptistry was not over here. It was in the floor somewhere here. Do any of you remember the baptistry that was in the floor? And, uh, and if you remember that, what, what used to happen with the baptisms in that time, um, the, the floor would be opened and um, there would be water in the pool. And at the time of baptisms, all the little children would gather around um, the pool and uh, the baptism would happen, the prayer would happen in the pool and then the person would go out. And, and I can remember baptizing Deirdre and Hans Snickers. <laughs> and, um, and I can remember it was like, you know, God had, has done, a, and if you've ever heard Hans's testimony, it's just a magnificent testimony of what's God's grace in his life and, and Deirdre and, and the children. And we were reminiscing in Cape Town the other day. We met with them um, in their daughter's flat and we just reminiscing of this particular day because, I mean, Hans is a big guy. And um, and so there was water, the pool was full, and, and I had baptized Deirdre, and the children were close by. And I'm like, guys, you need to move a little bit away from the pool. And the children were like, the more I told them to move away from the pool, the more they were moving towards the pool. And I thought, uh, in the end, I just thought, I'm just going to baptize him and see what happens. And, and, like, and if you, in terms of baptism, I, I baptize people backwards into the water, and as I baptized Hans into the water, it was like a wave just went <laughs> all over the kids and all over the people that were around us. And um, it was just a glorious memory. And there's so many glorious memories of, of ministry here. And, and here we're told uh, to remember Jesus Christ. And I want to ask just, you know, why are we told to do that? Because God is the God of new beginnings in the history of of our failure because God is the God who brought new beginning into our lives and who's changed our hearts and changed our lives and who has given every single one of us a testimony. And we're told to remember him. We are told to remember him and to proclaim him until he comes again. And uh, there's a passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 that says, For I have received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, for, for which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me, in order to remember the sacrifice that was made on the cross of Calvary, in order to remember what he's done in every one of our individual lives, that he has taken us out of darkness and brought us into his glorious light, that he has, we have been made new creations, that 
He has brought us into his family. We are to remember Jesus Christ. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Again, just to remember Jesus. To remember Jesus. As as, As often as you eat the bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. And so we get to remember and we know that the Passover is also, if you go a little bit further on in, in chapter 12, was they were instructed to commemorate the Passover, and they told really just how to do that um, in the wilderness, how they to do that as the history and the nation of, of the people. They got to do certain things. And there were just some really interesting uh, little words in there. And we, I was just doing a study, and, and I just thought, look, there's a lot of things that here in this passage that I don't really always know exactly what it means. And so I just thought, you know, what does yeast mean? And what does hyssop mean? And what are these kinds of words? What do they mean? What is the bitter herbs? And how does that all reflect into um, the Passover? Well, yeast was basically uh, about the cleansing of sin. And uh, the people were told to get rid of all yeast. It was a symbol of sin. Not that there was anything wrong with yeast, because we know people would eat yeast. But the, the unleavened bread was because they they were told to cleanse their homes, to make their homes ready for God to pass over in this particular instance. We know that hyssop, for instance, was for the healing and for forgiveness. And and hyssop really is one of those plants that looks a little, is a a herb. And uh, I don't know if any of you remember just where else hyssop was used in the New Testament, for instance. There's one place in the New Testament that hyssop is mentioned, and I don't know if anyone just out of hand just knows where that happened. Anybody? At the cross. It happened when uh, a sponge of, of wine vinegar was placed onto the end of, of a, a branch of hyssop. And it's, it's so significant that that actually happens because it's for the forgiveness of sins. It's for a healing of the people. It's for a comfort of the people. And there is, are all these amazing words and all these amazing things. The bitterness and the bitter herbs were for the bitterness of slavery and, and how the people were being brought out of bondage and of slavery and of the bitterness of slavery and brought into the new freedom that God had for them um, as a nation. And, and for them, there was a new beginning, even a new calendar it's spoken of here for Israel's redemption from Egypt, where uh, the very first verse in that um, passage says, uh, the Lord said to Moses and Aaron in Egypt, this month is to be for you the first month, the first month of your year. This is a new beginning. There is something deeply significant that is going to happen um, in, as a result of the Passover. And so they're given these various instructions of, of the different things to do. And um, it was that they were to bring in a lamb. And the lamb was to live amongst them. I don't know, uh, it could be a goat or a sheep. Um, Today, goats are called, baby goats are called kids, and uh, sheep are called lambs. But in this case, it could have been a goat or a sheep. I don't know how many of you have eaten mutton or eaten goat and and know the difference. You probably know that my mother, for instance, when people come to the farm, sometimes she only has a leg of goat in the deep freeze and and people say they don't eat goat, and so she cooks the food, and she just says she'll put it in front of them, see what happens, and normally people just gobble it up anyway, even though they say they'll never eat goat. But it was a lamb for a family, a lamb that was to be without blemish, and it was to be a lamb that was going to be, where the blood was going to be painted across the doorposts of the home in order that God would pass over in the moment where he is bringing out the nation, bringing out the people, and they were to eat the lamb through the night. And the lamb was to, be, to um, also just be completed, and it was to be finished. And again, as we look at Jesus, we recognize that, you know, that his work was finished. His work was completed on the cross of Calvary. With, our, with their belts around their waist, their sandals on their feet, and the staff um, in their hands, just symbolness of, of readiness to go where it was that God was leading them, that God was taking them out of, the, out of Egypt and into a new place, a new um, uh, time in their lives. And as a rescue to deliver 
Israel from the plague of the firstborn, as an institution to remember that God's rescue and deliverance for Israel was through every generation. And a powerful drama, this, uh, the Passover was in um, acting out this perfect sacrifice and the rescue of Jesus that Jesus would later provide. The lamb would have to be brought in amongst them to, to live amongst them for four days because we know that the Passover period was about seven days. It was six nights, seven days. And on the fourth of those days, then the lamb would, would be sacrificed. But we also know as, as we think about the Passover, we also recognize that the Passover is a, as we think about it as believers, that it was also a new beginning, a new calendar for man's redemption. Because we know that in John chapter 1, that magnificent verse where, where John the Baptist sees Jesus, and on two occasions he does it in chapter 1 of, of John's gospel, where he sees Jesus walking towards him, and he cries out, Behold, look, take note, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And the incarnation of Jesus and the coming of Jesus into man and to live amongst man is, is very much found in the symbol of the lamb coming into the home that had to live with the people until the moment that it was, that it was sacrificed. And Jesus comes to live amongst man until that moment that he is crucified um, as a result of our sin. And John the Baptist, behold, the lamb of God. And we know that this theme just carries on all the way through as the Exodus theme carries on throughout John's gospel. And in John chapter 3, that magnificent verse where it says, For God so loved the, the world, or God loved the world in this way, that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life or have eternal life. And just before that, it says, Just as Moses lifted up the, the snake in the wilderness, so Jesus will be lifted up. And when Jesus is lifted up, he will draw all men to himself, and we know that he come, we come to Jesus for the healing of our souls. We come to Jesus for the redemption of our souls. You see, Jesus lived with and became bonded to human family because he, before he was sacrificed to them, for, for them. The sacrifice of Jesus has to be appropriate to each person, not simply a nation or a community. He comes to us personally. Jesus, the Passover lamb, was spotless. Perfectly so, not stained by sin, any moral or spiritual imperfection. And it was only the blood of Jesus, his actual poured out life, that atoned for our sin. In death, Jesus was touched with the fire of God's judgment. In death, Jesus received the bitter cup of God's judgment. And the work of Jesus has to be received fully with none left in reserve. And the Passover work of Jesus for his people is the dawn or the prelude of their freedom. And the work of Jesus for us is the prelude. It's the, the beginning of our freedom. And so we are to remember Jesus. We are to remember the sacrifice that he made for us. But we also get to remember the fact that he died for us personally. And if I just say to you, um, just stand up in three minutes, share with the congregation what your personal testimony is, and how it is that Jesus, even in this age, came to you and, and showed himself and, and you recognized that you uh, needed him and you needed his salvation and that you needed his grace. If I were to do that with you, I would tell you about a little boy, a young boy in his teens who, who was just so filled with guilt as a result of the deception and all the stuff that he was doing. And, and I would tell you about a young guy who, who a friend came to and said to him, Basil, won't you just come with me to a Trevor Goddard um, rally. And won't you just come and just hear what the man has to say? We know that you've been getting into a lot of trouble at school. We know that things have not been going your way, but just come with me. And you'll, I'll tell you about a young guy who, who stood up that night and, and there was just this overwhelming sense of, of guilt before and then just recognizing that Jesus came to die for my guilt, for my sin, in my place that that I could know redemption, that I could know newness of life, that I could experience new life in Christ Jesus. And I could tell you about a young man who walked out of that place, a new man, knowing that, yes, there were still things that God had to sort out along the way. There was still a journey to take, but there, there was this incredible thing that God had done in my life. 
And every one of you who names the name of Jesus has a moment in your life or perhaps a period in your life where you came to the realization that you needed the Savior, that you needed this Jesus that we have been worshiping throughout this weekend, that you needed him as your Savior and as your Lord. And you came before him and you received him and you accepted him as your Lord and Savior. One of the, the, the most magnificent sermons that I've ever listened to, and I've, I've heard a lot of sermons in the course of my life, and, and uh, I could take you to a whole lot of different people that you would know, and I don't even know if you'll know who this particular man is, but he's an American preacher by the name of E.V. Hill. And E.V. Hill uh, is just takes us through, and if you, if you want to go and Google this, I know there's no video on it, but there's an audio on YouTube by E.V. Hill, which is just this, this incredible sermon that he reminds us of the salvation that has been brought into our lives individually. And what E.V. Hill does is he goes through creation and he says, you know, it was God at his best when he was creating the universe? And he, he tells us a little bit about the greatness of the universe and how, how big the universe is and how big God must be to have created. And, and, and he begins to tell us about this. And then he goes on and he says, well, was God at his best? his best when he created mankind and when he created them in his own image and he, and he gave, breathed life into them, was God at his best? And then he, he speaks about the Exodus and says, was, was God at his best when he split the Red Sea and when he brought the Israelites out of Egypt and when he brought them into a place of deliverance? Was God at his best? And he goes through all these different things and, and he ends up eventually at, at this one moment where a little boy uh, in the rural towns of America heard the gospel for the first time and bowed his knee. So many years after Jesus had lived, so many years after Jesus had died, so many years after Jesus had come and ascended him back into heaven, and he came to him, and he gave him new life in Christ Jesus. The old had gone, the new had come, and there was this new person, this new creation, brought into a new family, adopted in now into the very family of God, being brought into as a child, that by God's Spirit, you and I can cry, Abba, Father, that we can have this personal relationship with Him, that we can enjoy that on a daily basis. And you have that testimony. And we've been speaking about on mission with God over the last little while, over the last uh, couple of days. And I want to say to you that one of the most incredible things that God has given you is your testimony. And in a world that is very skeptical, and in a world that is very suspicious of Christianity for whatever reason, rightly or wrongly, in a world that there is all kinds of philosophies, and all kinds of the things that are happening when you stand up in your family, when you stand up amongst your friends and they know who you were before, they know how your life has changed, and, and you stand up and then you say to them, like the blind man, I love the blind man in the, in the Gospels, because the, the people are all arguing about what has happened. You know, was it his parents that sinned because we know the blind man is healed? And um, Jesus heals him, and the parents are not are confused by what's happened. And some are thinking, you know, they, they've been deceiving him all along, deceiving the people all along. And, and the, the blind man, there are all these people debating and discussing and trying to argue about what has actually happened with this miracle. And eventually they get back to the blind man and say to him, well, what do you say? And he, he almost says, like, I don't know what you guys are on about. But this one thing I know, I was blind. And now I can see. Simple, straightforward. I was blind, and now I can see. And your testimony, as you speak, stand up and speak of what God is doing in your life, as you tell people of who Jesus is, not in a necessarily even in a confrontational way, but just saying, "This is yeah, I, I respect what you believe, but." I want, you to tell, I want to tell you just what I believe in, and I want to tell you what God is doing in my life and, and how he's still working and how he's changing me and how he's challenging my motives and how every single day of my life as I read the word, he's, he's helping me with this life. I just want to tell you what he's doing in my life. I don't want to debate with you. I just want you to understand that this is who Jesus is. And in doing that, God gives you a mission and gives you a message, the simple simple, straightforward message of the gospel 
of Jesus Christ. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God and to salvation of everyone who believes. And the gospel is a message that comes to the simplest person in the simplest place where there is no education, and it comes and it breaks through into hardened hearts, and it draws men and women and boys and girls into his family. It comes on to the, to the professors. It comes to those who are educated, those who are wealthy, to those who have it all together, to those um, who don't understand everything, but but it comes and it breaks through into hardened hearts and God calls them and draws men and women to himself and the gospel of Jesus Christ that he came, that he died, that he rose again, that he ascended into heaven, that he is with us by his spirit, that he's changing us and that he's making us into the image of his son, that he's brought us into his family, that he's given us new life and new hope, changes hearts and lives. And you just need to share that and you just need to open your heart to those around you and be unashamed. There's a new beginning for men and women and, and boys and girls around this area of Waterkloof Baptist Church. As you're on mission, you don't have to go out very far. You don't have to, you just have to be here if you're a youth lead on a Friday night and children will come into that place where they do not know Christ and who do have no idea of what Jesus is about and who have not heard the gospel and haven't read the Bible and it's becoming more and more evident that this is the case, that God will open doors for you in this. I was just sharing with some folk during the camp that we have a lady who, who works in the schools um, and she is fantastic and she's part-time on staff with us in Cape Town. She is just a wonderful, amazing servant of God. She just gives of herself 100%. And at the beginning of last year, she came to me and she said to me, Basil, the school has changed its policy. Up until now, I've been able to freely share about Jesus. I've been able to tell the children, and you know, at the, in the class, I've got to always respect those of other faiths, and I've got to say to people you know, that if you don't want to be here, you can move out of the class or you can go somewhere else or to the library if that's what you want to do, but you don't have to listen to the message. But, but, um, and, and people could go and then she could tell them about Jesus. But at the beginning of last year, the school came to her and they said to her, we still want you here. We, we desperately want you to be here. And uh, we want you to speak about morality. We want you to speak about values but we don't want you to speak about Jesus. And we don't want, you, you can no longer ask children to go out the class, um, but you can answer any questions that the children ask, whatever the questions are, or you can respond to any statement that whatever the children make. And we kind of tossed this around because essentially they were saying to us that we can't do what we've been doing. And the, the relationship with Durbanville Baptist Church with that particular school goes years back. Dan was our children's worker, and he worked in that school. I remember when he left the school, they gave, you gave you a briefcase as a gift full of letters from all the children in the school and from the teachers of the school, and it was just this briefcase full of letters of appreciation. Uh, before Dan, there was another lady by the name of Anthea Francis who was there, and Taryn Mundell, and, and so the relationship with Durbanville Baptist Church has gone for years and years and years and years, and we were just asking ourselves now, what now? What do we do that they've told us we cannot speak about Jesus? And we decided we're going to go, and we're going to ask God to open doors, and we're going to carry on the relationship. And Carrie Ann went in, and faithfully, just as she's done before, and she started speaking on the values that they asked her to speak about. And then what began to happen, the children got to know her in the various classes, and then a child will sort of put up their hand and say, Ma'am, you know, when my parents tell me about that value, they always bring Jesus into the picture. Can you tell us how Jesus fits into the picture? Well, that is perfectly legal. And she could then just speak of Jesus openly and honestly and tell the children about Jesus and, and tell them what she believes. And, and so time and time again, over and over and over again, God continues to open doors that have been closed. And he brings 
those children to a place where they can understand the message of Jesus. And so I want to say to you this morning, this, this evening, as we close off the session, God has a mission for you, and, and that mission involves your testament. It involves what God is doing in your life. Just as he delivered the nation of Israel, he has delivered us through Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. And we remember him um, this evening. And so I'm going to close with that. And I want to just ask you now, as we prepare for the communion, there's a song that has been written by Phil Wickham that we've recently started singing um, as a congregation. And I just want to ask you to close your eyes. And I'm just going to read some of the words to you, and then I'm going to pray, and then I'm going to hand over to Pastor Paul. Remember those walls that we call sin and shame. They were like prisons that we couldn't escape. But he came and he died and he rose. Those walls are rubble now. Remember those giants we call death and grave. They were like mountains that stood in our way. But he came and he died and he rose. Those giants are dead now. Remember that fear that took our breath away. Faith so weak that we could barely pray. But he heard every word, every whisper. Now those are altars in the wilderness. Tell the story of his faithfulness. Never once did he fail, and never once will he. This is our God. This is our God who loves us. This is our God. This is what he does. He saves us. He bore the cross, beat the grave. Let heaven and earth proclaim, this is our God, King Jesus, who pulled me out of the pit, who paid for all my sin, who pulled me out of the pit, who paid for all my sin, who rescued me from the grave. This is my God. Father, we want to just thank you this evening at the end of this camp and it's been such a wonderful time to be together and to be able to just look at various things, Lord, in this journey of faith. And we thank you for Jesus again and that we get to remember our Lord Jesus Christ who died on the cross on our behalf. We want to thank you, Lord, that we can proclaim your death until you return and that your death on the cross and your resurrection from the dead, Lord, is life to those who believe and who receive the gift of grace that you bring and that you give. We thank you again, Lord. We give you praise in remembrance of what you've done. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.